Hey, my name is Adam Bricker, and you're listening to Cinepod, the cinematography podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben, how's it going? It is going outrageously wonderfully. How are you doing? It's going just fine. Hey, who's on the show today? We have Adam Bricker, recently nominated for an Emmy for Hacks, talking about Hacks before he was nominated. So that's why we don't talk about why he, you know, we don't say congratulations on your Emmy nom. Well, regardless, congratulations are due. Congratulations, Adam. It's a fantastic show. I'm glad you got you got recognized by um by the the Emmy folk and uh, with this with this lovely nomination, and uh, we talk about all kinds of stuff because Adam is a friend and a longtime client of Hot Rod. I've known him for probably around ten years now, maybe a little bit more. And yeah, it's it's a great show, and we get into all kinds of uh, good stuff. But uh, before that, Ben, what's our close focus today? What are we uh, What are we talking about? Our close focus, unfortunately, to my great chagrin, deals with. Uh, this disease you might have heard of called COVID nineteen. No, I haven't heard of this. What what is what is this? Uh, it's a little it's a little global <laughs> pandemic that we've been kind of dealing with. And let's just say a month or two ago, it really seemed like as a country and also as an industry, it appeared that we had our arms around this thing. And uh, then this new variant popped up called the Delta variant, and uh, the Delta variant is uh, spreading through our country like crazy and hitting mostly unvaccinated populations. But also known for the more than occasional crossover infection or breakthrough infection, as they call it. And uh, why am I talking about epidemiology? This isn't the epidemiology podcast, (laughs) Um, but I'm talking about it because it's officially shutting down productions. That's why. Yeah, I heard about Sean Penn uh, refusing to go back to work without a fully vaccinated crew. Is that is, is are you well, are you talking about that? Yeah, that was sort of the the lead off because it was there was a deadline article about Sean Penn and there's been a lot of uh, kerfuffle amongst people who are unvaccinated who don't want to have things like vaccine passports and honestly, I don't understand why don't get vaccinated, don't go be around other people. It's it's pretty much that simple. Eventually, COVID-19 won't be, you know, like as big of a national problem. So, you know, a year or two from now, you can come out from underneath the rock that you were living under and go do stuff. So vaccine passports have been very controversial. And people talk about the uh, what is it? The HIPAA rule that says, you know, that's about non-disclosure of your medical information. But it's it's about medical information disclosure from one corporation to another. Like so from your doctor to your insurance company or something like that. It has nothing to do with you disclosing to your employer whether or not you've been vaccinated for something. And schools and employers have been requiring vaccinations forever. It's just the way that we work in a society. And so Sean Penn basically walked off a set and said he's not coming back till everyone's vaccinated. And we're going to start seeing a lot more of that immediately. Well, it, it's not just this uh, Sean Penn television series. Uh, I know the NFL two days ago basically said, hey, huge fines and possibly even the forfeiting of games if teams are trying to play unvaccinated players. If, they, if, if the teams try to put people in who are unvaccinated, there's going to be problems. And talking about vaccine passports, I mean, Fox News famously has had vaccine passports now going on for months during the pandemic and have required their staff to be vaccinated to go to work, which I think is slightly ironic because I think that that, you know, Tucker Carlson was one of those people who was really railing against the idea of a vaccine passport. But it was revealed that he's got a vaccine passport. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to report to work in the same building with all those, which, other people. which means he's vaccinated, which means he's <laughs> fully vaccinated. Uh, but, well, oh my he, God. He, he refuses to say so. But uh, if you connect the dots, yes, he would not be able to be working unless he was staying home. But it seems like he hasn't been staying home. So it looks like he must be vaccinated. It's anyway, just a giant so. head shaker, <laughs> head shaker to me. And I mean, like it's the numbers. I look every day at the coronavirus numbers and they are troubling. Like in my home state of Florida, where um, they're averaging, I think, about 13,000 new cases a day. The emergency rooms are starting to get filled up. And it's like, I thought we were past all this stuff. Yeah. And I, I just I felt like we were all going to be able to get back to our lives. That was 
what it looked like for a minute, uh, and it's it's just so frustrating. So I, I honestly support Sean Penn. Uh, there's a sentence I haven't said often uh, in in walking <laughs> off the set. Um, a friend of mine who uh, uh, will remain nameless, but is the lead on a TV show, told me that, and, and he's one of the leads. He told me that uh, they had like a big Zoom meeting about coronavirus, about how they were doing the protocols, and the crew was sort of like, ah, how seriously are we going to take this? And my friend said, look, if if you guys don't take this seriously, I'm walking off. And guess what? They're not going to fire me. Hmm. And 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 he was right. <laughs> you know, like he doesn't want to get sick. You know, uh, it's uh, it, and he's got the power. I, I, I feel like it's going to come down to stuff like that. You know, I, I, I don't know. You know, uh, Kevin Sorbo and Stephen Baldwin could go make an unvaccinated movie somewhere if they feel like it. But. Uh, you know, Rick, Ricky did you Schroeder. All, all this. <laughs> did you name them specifically because they've said they will not get vaccinated? Actually, I don't know if Steve. I don't know about Stephen Baldwin. Ricky Schroeder was the one who was like yelling at someone who was like the manager of a Costco because oh, he wanted to go inside unmasked. Yeah, it's just like, uh, just I don't. I I don't understand why people can't get it through their heads that uh, a global pandemic. It's somewhat inconvenient, so you got to look like a dental hygienist for a few months, maybe a few years. We all got to wear wear a mask. It just really, it really riles me up. And when it comes to shooting, where we're all in close quarters, and we've come up with all of these protocols for the way that shoots are run in in a time of coronavirus, you know, they're probably going to run like that for a while, even as it goes away. But right now, it's not going away. Right now, it's on the rise. All 50 states in America have a higher incidence of coronavirus, and that is going to ripple right straight through our business, which was just sort of starting to get going again. Yeah, it, it was really uh, going well, and uh, hopefully uh, it doesn't totally derail, but uh, you know, we're all kind of holding our breaths, our breath right now. Yes. No, no pun intended, but uh, yeah. Which, which, some, which some you should definitely do if you're not wearing a mask on. anyway. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hey, let's get to the interview with uh, Adam Bricker. Here's Adam Bricker. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. All right. So we are here, uh, tr- uh, not transcontinentally, on the same continent, but on opposite coast, bi coastally, with uh, Adam Bricker, the cinematographer of the amazing uh, new show Hacks on HBO, which I have seen every episode of. Love it. Great work. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled and honored to be here. So Hacks is like uh, HBO sort of has stuff that feels like Game of Thrones, like giant, big budget monster stuff. And then they have what almost feel like indie features from the 90s that are turned into a series. And that that's kind of the vibe of this TV series. And it's very personal and very character driven and, and brilliant and beautiful. And I'm interested to know, like when you were given the script, how did you feel about the best way to go about shooting it? I'd love to hear about what your approach was. Yeah, I received the uh, the pilot script. I think they sent over the first two episodes, and the pilot script was just like incredible. And there aren't that many half hour comedy scripts that you get that on the page open with a long steady cam oneer um, <laughs> following a, a character for you know two minutes. The the, the very show good opens. Fellas. It, it, it felt, yeah, it felt right. very good, fellas. And then it's it's written that the camera follows her through the backstage of her Las Vegas theater into the corridors of, of the casino, always on her back. And then in the script, it sort of indicates that we reveal her in her dressing room vanity mirror. And I was just like so excited reading those first pages. Like you don't you don't get many half hour comedy scripts that have that level of cinema, I guess, for lack of a better term. Typically, comedies are brighter. There's like a generic comedy look that maybe you have in your head a preconceived notion of like what a half hour comedy looks like. And I, what I really valued about this project and the collaboration with Lucia, who is the showrunner and, and directed the majority of the episodes, is that we both sort of subscribed to the notion that the look didn't, it didn't have to be bright and poppy to indicate that things were funny. It could be emotionally driven and the visuals could uh, help tell the story. And the scripts are just like so funny. And the performers are just like, you know, Gene Smart and Hannah Einbinder are They're going to be funny no matter how it looks. You don't need to sort of underscore that. So when I first read the pilot, I liked this notion that the Deborah Vance character, her heyday was behind her. She was stuck in the past a little bit. We looked at a lot of vintage Las Vegas images and movies and and used those as a reference. So it had this nostalgic kind of old fashioned feel to it. 
Were there any uh, specific references that you were looking at? I mean, that first shot, it's hard to think of that first shot and not think of Goodfellas. And honestly, it's hard to watch so much stuff shot in Vegas in like opulent, beautiful houses and not think about Casino. Um, Yeah. We looked at those films. I think like um, we were really interested in Behind the Candelabra. Um, oh yeah, the, the Soderbergh, Soderbergh movie. movie. It's a gorgeous and, movie too. Um, I really loved the weird, like vintage quality to the lensing on that, um, and the way that sort of like the shears blew out in those films. Like a lot of the images that we pulled for that were major touchstones for us in the look. And then a movie that um, Lucia turned me on to is this the one this wonderful film that came out a couple of years ago, uh, Judy with Renee Zellweger. Oh yeah, and I loved I loved loved how that film was shot. And there's so much stage performance work in that film, and. Uh, the, the cinematographer on that, what I what I loved is that the the performance would sort of the lighting would sort of shift based on where the character was. So mm-hmm. in a positive moment, it might be a little bit warmer and softer with the spotlight. But then when she's at her worst, it's a little bit cooler and a little harsher and a little harder. And those were just like wonderful things that we were borrowing when, and trying to to apply here. That's awesome. Yeah. No. I, yeah. So, well, and I, I guess like when I think about making comedies and character based stuff I don't think about the level of it wasn't previs but it was a kind of previsualization that you were doing were you working off of any kind of storyboards or anything like that and how how far before the shoot were you even looking at that stuff yeah the the challenge of a tv show is that you don't have you don't have all the scripts in advance you uh. you sort of are we were sort of setting the look based on the first couple of scripts and then as we were in production additional scripts would sort of come in the amount of prep you have varies dramatically from episode to episode and from set to set. Like, you know, some of the stuff for the pilot, like the, the living room that we that we constructed, we we were thinking about that for many weeks and could uh, think about Lucia was would be very specific with the blocking and we would have overheads drawn and you could get really nitty gritty with the prep on that. And then for other things, just because the reality of television, like sometimes it'd be a we I hadn't even been to a location just because I had been uh, shooting while that location was found and scouted yeah. and it would be all, not a last minute thing, but but almost that I mean you've got to sort of adapt so my process is to sort of try to take as much of the of the technical out of my prep as possible and really make it story based so I work my way through the scripts and I'm sort of thinking about where the characters are what we're trying to have the audience feel on a subconscious level and making just almost like emotional beats in my scripts and sort of using that as the basis for the technical decisions that we're that we're making I found that that's really helpful because uh, when I do do have to make a, a last minute decision or adapt to a new location. The creative choices that I'm making on the fly are really grounded in like a narrative arc. Um, how do you uh, like to me the, the most interesting thing is how you keep track of that. Like, do you have a physical script that you print out and you write notes in a physical script? You use scriptation. Like, how do you know? Because you're shooting out of order. How do you know on the day like, oh, this is the day that we're trying to underscore this piece of the subtext? You know. Yeah, I do it in, I use scriptation, which is great on, on all projects, but, you know, especially so on a television show when new drafts are coming in regularly because it allows you to sort of transfer the, the notes that you've made. Oh, I don't magical. want this to become an ad for scriptation, but. No, no. I mean, we, we've talked about scriptation a few times and I always think it, it's always good to know what the tools that people are using are because scriptation's very reasonably priced. And uh, that thing where it transfers your notes to the new draft and tells you what it removed is, is kind of magic. So we're not yeah. spon- we're not sponsored by scriptation, <laughs> but but it, but it is awesome. Yeah, no, I think I go I go through the script and I try to force myself to like write a little something about each scene, which sort of forces me to think about it. Even the simplest of scenes, I'll, I'll some idea or some vibe or like something that I, that I want to feel like or like, oh, this is the pivotal moment. Let's make sure, you know, this is happening. And then I'll go in and I, I'm, I'm big on culling a large collection of visual references. And, you know, I'll build I'll build a library using like film grab or, or shot deck or something like that. And I'll start putting the placing those into the scripts. And I try to like pretty much put everything into the script. So um, my notes on the character beats, these visual references, eventually a shot list, technical notes for my gaffer, my key grip. I try to use the script as like sort of a hero document. And I share those with my camera operators, my gaffer, my key. And I've, I found that that's really helpful instead of having like a bunch of disparate documents. Um, I used to make like Google Sheets things and would find that I would never look at them. What's great about having everything in the script is that when you're on set and you're on the fly um, and the actors are rehearsing a scene and you're trying to, you're seeing 
on your script, your initial notes about um, the, the mood and vibe and the, and the storytelling. And, and those are right in your hand as you're watching the actors, you know, rehearse and you're referencing them and able to sort of apply them to the decisions that you'll make right after that rehearsal. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I, everyone has a different way of doing it, but I do. Th- I actually think that it's interesting to hear people talk about. I I first heard about scriptation interviewing another DP on here, and he was like, "Oh my god, you haven't seen it!" And he showed me like all of his notes in the script, and I was like, "Jesus Christ!" Like you can you can kind of keep every idea in one place, and like you said, make it shareable. I just want to jump in here. It seems to me in hacks there tends to be uh, a couple of different types of scenes. There are scenes in which uh, propel the story, and there are scenes which you know develop characters. But one of these, one of the sort of the archetypes, it almost feels like the show, are these duels, the these verbal duels between Deborah and Ava. And when we get into these duels, sometimes Deborah ends up on top, sometimes Ava ends up on top. But I almost notice, and and th- this is probably something really subtle, and maybe I'm just reading more into it, but. These duels almost get this handheld treatment, these subtle little like handheld moves. It's like, you know, there, there's a zinger from Deborah, and then you, you the, the camera almost feels like, oh, wow, you know, like, like you know, the thrust came in, the parry came in, you know, or, or the blow came in. You like you feel like the framing that's going on in these these verbal duels is almost being reflected in, in, in what's happening. Is it, Am I just reading way too much into this or is there a, is there a conscious thought of like, you know, having a your, your framing and this sort of like. Uh, very gentle handheld movements reflecting what's going on in the scene. Yeah, absolutely. We weren't, you know, we, we jumped back and forth on hacks between more traditional, like stable camera movements on, on a dolly or, or tripod and then handheld sort of easy rig operating. And a lot of the, uh, the decision making there was sort of, there was a logic behind it. A lot of it was sort of intuitive from the director, Lucia, would sort of like come to a scene and have a feeling intuitively about what was best. Should this, does this feel like a handheld scene or does this feel like a stick scene? And um, we really wanted those kind of arguments that you're those, those duels that you're referencing between Ava and Deborah to feel very naturalistic. And I think that we were both, the handheld made it sort of feel a little, a little alive. And what I think was great was that we had this contrast between these a lot of the show is shot on sticks and dollies and is very stable and then we'd sort of cut to the handheld and it's the handheld operating is good i think like our operators did a wonderful job like it's it's composed and and stable and and it isn't frenetic it just gives it like a little bit of energy and a little extra touch of naturalism and i think that the back and forth like kind of underscores that like you feel the change it's subtle. It's it's definitely something that I think works subconsciously. Was there a different approach? I mean, obviously, there's always a different approach to lighting different actors. But was there an approach to light Deborah in more of a classical movie star kind of a way and, and everyone else kind of look more like they were just basking in her light in a way, but not as movie star looking? Yeah. I mean, a lot of the the references that we had were sort of lit in that classical kind of movie star way, but I wanted to make it feel very naturalistic. And I also wanted it to feel very cohesive. So it wasn't, I I wanted it to feel like there was this look and a lot of the look of the show is inspired by the Deborah Vance character, but I wanted to create a cohesive world. So that carried through the entirety of the, of the series. This whole show was uh, produced during COVID too, right? There was like, uh, you you had to, uh, deal with, I'm guessing, uh, frequent testing and closed, uh, uh, like, can you tell a little bit about the the process? Because here it is, we're just now starting to see some of the the stuff over the last, you know, few months, completely shot, produced, posted in in COVID. What was it like for you on set trying to, to manage with that? It was challenging. I mean, I think, you know, there's the stuff that you hear about, you know, the, the, the frequent testing every every morning and yeah. then you're, you're wearing a ton of PPE, just, you know, all, all the stuff you need to do to keep that's really important. I, I like to think that in the end, you can't really tell that we shot it during the pandemic. Like, I think that we I had no idea. Yeah. And, and it's sort of during the, you know, for the last year, like every new series that came out, uh, you know, I always felt like, ah, oh, they probably did it before the pandemic and we're, you know, waiting on a release. So the fact that it was done during the pandemic to me is uh, it, it's actually inspiring to see that you were able to, to make something that didn't feel constrained in that way. It, it just felt it, and, and I wonder how many of the pandemic level restrictions are going to stick around, you know, for the foreseeable future. Are we still going to yeah. wearing PPE on sets? Yeah, I mean, for as annoying as it was, we're all like just very fortunate to be able to work in an industry that 
made it a priority to take care of of its of its workers and its its labor and its employees. So yeah. I think like you know we were we were conscious of that while we were filming that we were in a we were in a fortunate spot that we were we were being tested regularly and and, and protected. You know, I want to jump in and talk about the look a little bit here. You, you've got so many different, you've got so many different sort of looks in the show, including a look that is, it seems like the performance look. There's a look of Deborah Vance performing on stage that is, uh, they go back, you go back to it several times of like the spotlight, out of focus lights in the background, all kinds of stuff that is like very much a performance, and then the reality of sort of uh, life in Las Vegas and moving all around the world. Did you consciously set out? to really kind of define spaces, define the space of like, this is Las Vegas, Las Vegas is going to have a, a certain feel, Los Angeles is going to have a certain feel, where you're trying to really draw a distinction between uh, the locations and, and the looks you were making. Yeah, definitely. I think in the beginning uh, episode, we're sort of intercutting between Deborah in Las Vegas and Ava in Los Angeles, and their worlds don't sort of meet until the very end of the pilot, but we're going sort of we're going sort of back and forth. And in the beginning, Deborah's Las Vegas has this sort of vintage kind of golden feel. There's like a old fashioned kind of glamour to it. And when we cut to uh, Ava in LA, we're sort of doing a little bit of contrast there. When we first meet Ava, she's at her lowest point. She's just been sort of canceled and, you know, lost her her writing deal is really at a, at a low point in her life. And I had this sort of idea that we, when you, I think when you think of, when I was looking for references of LA, most of the things you see in films and photographs are like, it's sunny, you know, California sunshine, like warm, gold, beautiful. And I had this idea that we would keep Ava very subtly in sort of soft shadow and then whenever possible, we would have that sunshine sort of in the deep background. Oh. Like it is sort of like unobtainable for her. Like she she can oh. see it, but she can't have it. That's brilliant. Yeah. So we like in her agent's office, she's sort of in a cloud. But in the deep background, there's there's the sunny mountains of L.A. Uh, that you see out the window or when there's even like one shot where in the, in the pilot where she's sitting on her toilet on the phone and the door behind her, there's a splash of sunlight in the deep background. But there's Ooh. like a very distinct color temperature difference between the two of them. She's in this like sort of cool, soft light and there's the warmth behind her. We were just like very, very conscious, very conscious of that. And yeah, I think like that, that was the idea from the onset was that just, you know, very subtly and naturalistically, you would have a look that was motivated by Deborah's story and a look motivated by Ava's. And then they would sort of collide. So I always like to ask people like, what was the first moment that you realized cinematography was like a thing you could do? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I, um, so I went to film school in Chicago. I went to uh, DePaul, DePaul University uh -huh. and it was a new film school at the time. They had just started like a digital cinema program and it was, it was really, really a wonderful, wonderful experience. Like you got to get right in, you know, down and dirty, like making stuff immediately. And I, I really loved it. And a friend of mine, after my first year, he was uh, heading to Los Angeles for the summer to go to USC. They sort of offer a, a summer program where um, anyone who, you know, people who aren't enrolled in the, in the university can come and take a select group of, of film school classes, the USC summer cinema program. And he invited me to go. I'd never been to California. I just thought it would be a great way to spend the summer. The class that he was taking was this beginning cinematography course. And so I went with him to LA and just like took this course and immediately just like fell in love. I'd had a wonderful experience at DePaul. It was sort of like a indie film kind of boot camp type thing where it wasn't really, you know, roles weren't defined. Everyone was sort of pitching in. I didn't know I wasn't really so aware that there was like a profession as a cinematographer and going to, to this USC program, like really opened, opened my eyes. And I decided to apply to, to, to transfer and was really fortunate to, to get into USC and, and, and finish my film school education there. I was at USC and I think like what was continued studying cinematography. And I think about what was great there was that so many people in the majority of your peers in film school, they all aspire to be directors mm -hmm. and being 
a cinematographer like gives you an opportunity to collaborate with a whole bunch of people and work on everyone's films, not just your own. I really loved that. Let, let's, yeah. Let me interject here and talk a little bit about your early entrepreneurial days, because I think it must have been, been close to this. When I first met you, you and two buddies bought a camera and started a little rental company and started shooting projects for, I mean, I know it was humble beginnings back then, but it seemed like you guys were shooting projects left and right. You were not going to let your camera sit and collect dust. You guys were, were working that thing like crazy. So uh, talk, oh, talk, talk a little yeah. bit about starting your, you start a little business, renting a camera and, and shooting projects. Well, I'll, ba- I'll backtrack even a little bit. Like I, gr- I graduated school and I thought like I had this little career path set out for me where I would start in the camera department and sort of work my way up. So right out of school, I would take jobs as a, as a, as a loader or a second AC. And my goal was to accumulate enough union days and sort of just work my way up to operator and eventually DP. And I was second ACing on a, on a, on an indie film that this DP from New York, Tim Naylor was shooting. And, and one day at lunch, he pulled me aside and sort of asked me, you know, what I wanted to do. And I, I told him my plan. He was like, you need to, you need to quit this crew, this crew work sort of cold Turkey. If you want to be a DP, you got to be a DP. You've got to just, you've got to start shooting right away. And I don't know, I, th- I, th- I thought about this and his point was that people sort of see you the way that they first meet you. And that it is actually very hard to sort of climb this ladder. I took Tim's advice to heart and stopped my plan to join the union as a second AC and just started, started shooting the, you know, whatever I could get my sort of, whoever would let me shoot something, I would like some kids short film, or I would, you know, just like aggressively uh, hunt for jobs on Mandy.com or, or Craigslist. Simultaneously, two of my friends, uh, we, we also, we, we raised some funds and sort of pitched in together to buy uh, a Red One camera. And that was really, we worked that thing like crazy, but that was really helpful for me in those early days when I was shooting, you know, infomercials that I found on, on Mandy.com. I was able to sort of, I had the, I had tools that could take those projects, not to another level. I mean, they were what they were, but like, at least I was sort of like practicing the craft and shooting something that, you know, I was proud of, you know what I mean? I was getting, I was getting something out of that. You know, I, I, I feel like we talked to people who did do what you were describing, like who did work their way up through either uh, the lighting department or the camera department to become DPs. And, you know, it's a journey that could take 20 years or more and then we talked to a lot of people who are who do exactly what what you did which is like i'm gonna i'm just gonna shoot i'm gonna shoot whatever size project the, the biggest project i can get my hands on and you know i think they're both pretty valid paths but it kind of all depends on where the fire in your belly is yeah I mean, it's, a, it's it's a path that worked for me it's not to say that, that my yeah. path is, is better than any other path i think what it did do for me was that it forced me to have an open mind um about pretty much you know any any project that would would come to me like I would shoot happily and 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 make it the best it, it could be and so you know I'd put my putting my all into a you know a, a Craigslist music video um and and trying to put my my spin on it and I think that that sort of mentality that mentality really really helped me in my early career and then even even to this day I think like if I wasn't if I, if I hadn't been open-minded, I wouldn't have jumped headfirst into a, a food documentary series, which, which ended up being Chef's Table. Or um, I know Ilya wants to talk about that. Yeah, or a mockumentary about uh, dicks, which ended up being American Vandal. It was sort of like that mentality of like whatever comes to you, sort of you know put your spin on it and make it make it your own. Well, let, let's do this. Let's let's talk about Starry Eyes, because, you know, I think that was the first thing of yours that I saw. I It was playing somewhere locally and you invited me to come the, to come check it out. You're like, hey, you know, just want to let you know, I, I use that lens that I bought from you a lot on this movie and you should come check it out. And dude, it, it's it's well, you know, I'm going to let Ben talk because he's he's a fan. No, no. I mean, I, I love Starry Eyes, I, th- I think. Uh, and, and it's funny because I had to sort of be talked into watching it because I tend to not want to watch movies about like an actor just trying to blah, blah, blah. Like when I hear that that's. <laughs> Ben's Kryptonite is a movie about a movie that that drives him crazy. But but yeah. even like things Especially, that are related uh, related to that. But 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 like <laughs> so many of my friends are like, it's not really about that. Don't you know? Like definitely check it out. And I and I feel like it reminded me of Rosemary's Baby. It reminded me of you know so um, amazing movies like a lot of the devilly movies from like the seventies. And uh, the lead actor Alex Esso does such a fearless performance. Like she just goes for it, and it's so compelling. But uh, I don't know what the budget was on it. Like, I didn't really do a lot of research. It, I think that it was a relatively low budget horror movie, but it really yeah, has. I mean, Dennis and Dennis Kevin, Dennis and Kevin, who directed the film, Dennis Widmar and Kevin Kolsch, 
it was so long ago, so my memory is like a little hazy, but I actually think that they raised funds on, on Kickstarter for that film. So it was wow. like a true, a true indie project. But it's so good and it really holds up. I watched it. I think the last time I watched it was probably about a year and a half ago. And it's to me that that was definitely where your work like first kind of jumped out at me, because whenever I'm watching a movie, you know, that kind of blows my mind with whatever it is. The, the first question is who shot it? Um, and, and I remember looking you up at that point. Um, well, no, it's a, it's it was it's a, it's a film that I'm that I'm very proud of. And I think what I loved about that script was that it was so character based and. I shot it just like I would shoot any other any other movie uh, that's about a, a singular character, and then and then Dennis and Kevin just brought like brilliant horror to that. Yeah, Ilya, I, I know that you're a big fan of Chef's Table. Do you want to talk about uh, that? I, I do, as a matter of fact. And Adam, I remember when you when you got Chef's Table and you started telling me, you, you you told me a little bit about it. I think, uh, and then I didn't hear from you for a long time after that. I think that sort of dominated your your life for a bit and took you all over the world. And I'm not understating this here, but based on the conversations I was having with people sort of in the industry who were shooting other food shows or, or travel shows, of which we have quite a few number of clients that, that do. And I would say after Chef's Table, we started having people come in and say, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing a Chef's Table. We're, we're making a Chef's Table now. You know, we're honored with, a, with an Emmy Award nomination for that show as well for cinematography. But you actually creating that look and, and moving out with Chef's Table, you kind of defined the modern food show or food and travel show genre. Very big budget look, gimbal type of movements and tons and tons of shots of food being handled and moved and and taken away from heat and onto heat and into refrigeration in slow motion. And I will say that that show, I think really in some ways helped build Netflix. I heard so many people talk about Chef's Table when it was new. You know, I think uh, with, with Chef's Table, like uh, it's so much of the the credit goes to David Gelb, who created the show and his film, uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, which I like loved that movie so much when it came out. And like, I remember seeing it. I think I saw it at the downtown independent and then immediately went to Hamasushi in little Tokyo and like, was just like, it was just like a wonderful experience and it's a, it's a wonderful film. So we had like a great, we used that the sort of as a, as a, as a basis to sort of develop, develop the look for the show. Um, at the same time, I had never shot a documentary before and I'd never shot food before. Uh, and I, you know, I think like, Part of the reason why we were able to create something that folks consider to be different is just because of our own ignorance going into that. Will Basanta, who sh we handed off, we, we exchanged episodes, the, went back and forth. Will Basanta and I went back and forth shooting episodes the first uh, season of that show. And we just really wanted it to feel like a movie and to be as cinematic as, as possible. The story that our producer, Michael Hilliard, uh, always tells, he was our sort of our local producer in Australia, which was where we shot the first the first episode that went into production was shot in Melbourne, Australia. And we put together like an equipment carnet. All the gear that we were bringing in to, to, to Australia needed to be um, you know, pre-approved by customs. And Michael Hilliard, the producer in Australia, receives this carnet and he reaches out to the production team in, in L.A. And he's like, I think something's missing. There's no uh, there's no zoom lenses on this on this kit. You're doing this documentary. You're going to need zooms to sort of, you know, follow around the, the talent. And it was just sort of out of my ignorance. Like I didn't I didn't even think of that. You know, I completely planned on just shooting this entire documentary on on primes. And, uh, you know, it ended up just being like. Kind of like my own my own ignorance and and we ended up being like a happy accident we'd sort of developed this like shooting everything on a 35 millimeter prime in a documentary in a follow doc um was just something that wasn't wasn't typically done because it was just so inefficient but it developed a look that was you know cinematic and and, and very filmic and and i'll tell you a, a lot of longevity i mean six seasons a couple of spin-offs from this series this is like it's a major hit for netflix and really i gotta say that on at least three occasions we had people come in here and when i say here is, is hot red cameras they would come to the shop and i'd ask them like what they're doing or what they're buying gear for and it's like oh we're doing a chef's table except it's all in mexico or we're doing a chef's table and it's only going to be in this place in like eastern europe or we're doing a chef's table it's like it became a referenced look for for the world world of documentary, particularly 
food documentary. And if you're telling me that you didn't even use zoom lenses for that, it doesn't surprise me. But at the same time, uh, that's kind of amazing because usually when people think about documentaries, they think about, ooh, I got I to gotta move around, I got to be ready to react, and a zoom lens is, is the way that you do that. A zoom lens gives me the ability to, to reframe what I'm doing and not have to switch lenses. But it sounds to me like you composed and planned and said, hey, we're doing this on a 35, we're doing it on a 35. Is that is that pretty much? Yeah, I mean, I've got to admit, it was like a total. It was totally just because I didn't know what I was doing. I think what what ends up happening for when you're operating on a prime as opposed to a zoom in a documentary setting is you have to move your feet, and you can't just sort of stand and and pivot and zoom in to get a new shot. You physically have to move towards the subject or or with the subject. And once you're mobile, you really start thinking about angles and you're sort of forced to think about where your subject is in relation to the the pre-existing light and that style of of shooting just has been like really really wonderful for us and creates just like really cinematic uh beautiful results and then i'm you know we're obviously like so flattered that it's something that's been that people like and emulate i mean that's that's awesome for us we hope it goes on forever it's sort of like a it's a dream job that because of that show i've gotten to travel the world with my closest friends who are all you know directing or on the crew and it's just like you get to go to these great cities and you have this the chef that's like a wonderful tour guide and you get to go to all the great restaurants and it's just it's really it's really dreamy so i hope it goes on forever okay uh it would be easy to go down the rabbit hole of talking to you about a bunch of different things regarding chef's table i'm going to limit it to one episode uh Corrado Asenza, who, of course, this episode with Corrado, you were nominated for an Emmy Award for, for the show, and you spent, a, a looks like, a ton of time in uh, Noto in Sicily, in, in Italy. How long typically, I mean, like, look, it, it, the perception to me is that you're there for days and days and you do a lot of stuff, but I know that in the world of production, this could all be false. You could have been there for 24 hours or 48 hours. How long does it actually take for you to shoot one of these, one of these episodes? Because you've got tons of b-roll tons of like close-ups on the food tons of interviews you get you know sort of like bts slice of life you know cinema verite sort of stuff there, there's so many different components that go into a chef's table how much time do you actually have to to, to make this thing we shoot the the average episode in approximately like eight to nine maybe ten days what's fun about shooting chef's table is that it's the type of show where each episode you can get better and better at it. You sort of you figure out what works. You figure out what you want to do differently, how you want to change it. But it's 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 very satisfying in that respect. Like it's a it's a it's a muscle you're sort of working and you're you're refining you're refining the craft of making a, a chef's table. And we're very conscious of that that we you know that we have this short you know nine days is is a good amount of time relative to other documentaries, but it's still it's still a tight amount of time I think to tell someone's life story. We're very conscious of that and want it. Brian McGinnon, the director, and I really wanted to feel like we've sort of lived lived in that space. So we'll obviously we'll go in advance and we'll make sure that we've done enough enough homework to tell the story appropriately. But we've developed some sort of you know some tricks over the years. Like we made sure that Corrado had several wardrobes with him, and we try to shoot a like many different scenes in many locales in a, in a short period of time. So a typical day might include you know six or seven one hour scenes and we're then hopping back in the van and driving elsewhere. But we make sure that Corrado brings his wardrobe with him so that each scene he can sort of change his shirt and it gives you this sort of subconscious feeling like the filmmakers were there for it's a little magic trick to make it make us feel like we were there for months, yeah. <laughs> you know? Over the years of making that show, we've developed a pretty good formula for how to fit all the pieces of the puzzle together in that that condensed schedule. We'll do a, a sit down interview in the beginning and a sit down interview at the end, and then a day or two in the kitchen. Maybe one of those days we'll do some sort of service where you see some patrons, and then the rest of our work is sort of out out in the field shooting our our verite scene work. The way that that Brian McGinn, who directed that episode, and and I've most of the episodes that I've done the show, there's there's a multitude of of directors, but I, I primarily work with with Brian on the series, and he's got a really strong sense of narrative, and really when he's breaking down the narrative arc of the chef, tries his best to tie that narrative directly to dishes and have the dishes be sort of touchstones that guide you along the the narrative journey. So. We'll sort of 
when we're coming up with our verite scenes, it's 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 really fun to make because you're you're right there as a cinematographer, you're right there with the director, almost writing the script, coming up with scene ideas. And a great chef's table scene is a versatile scene because you even as much as you pre-plan a documentary, the the narrative is really fully constructed in the edit, and so you want the scenes to be able to work on on a, on a multitude of levels. So. You want to make sure all of the all of the angles are covered, and you're and you're working together to come up with scenes that are that are versatile, and then also just really full, you know, a variety of scenes that encompass sort of the the area that you're in. You know, the show is so is so rich in that it's not just like you get this one little trip out of the sit down interview or out of the kitchen. In the the Corrado episode, he also goes and uh, visits a a sheep farm and he goes and uh, finds, you know, where the milk is exactly coming from, which sheep that goes into the ricotta. A chef's table does all these extra layers where you just don't think, oh, we're not going to go to that layer. Oh, yes, we are. And now we're going to see that. And now we're going to see how this this builds uh, this builds up the world. Now, I think that yeah, it's like the basis of the of that is like you start with the ricotta gelato or the ricotta fill-in for the cannoli, and then you start working your way backwards, and you're like, okay, well, this is where they make the ricotta. Okay, well, where did they get the ingredients for that? You know, And then now you're at the sheep farm, and you start just trying to figure out all of the different elements that come together so that at the end you've gone on this journey, and when you see the final dish in the food symphony, you sort of know the origins of it. And then along the way, if those scenes that you're shooting can sort of help to tell the narrative, you know, now you're in a really good spot. I will say, like, the Corrado episode, Brian McGinn, the director, really wanted that to be a love letter to Sicily. And we're always looking for, like, different different techniques or, like, how we've already done this on a previous episode. What can we do differently here? Leading up to that episode, the majority of the show was shot uh, handheld by myself on an easy rig um, on the episodes that I, that I DP'd. And that was the we and we sort of dabbled a little in in Steadicam. We did, we'd maybe have like a Steadicam day, and that was the first episode, the Corrado Ascenza episode, where we decided to go all in on Steadicam. We brought this wonderful operator Joel Marsh to Sicily, and it was my first time working with him. And he just did a brilliant, brilliant job, and he operated every single frame in in the episode. And I think that the the steady cam like really really heightened that and and kind of made that episode distinct and almost like a fairy tale. And Joel just did a wonderful job. And we've gone on to work. He's he's been on everything I've done since. He's just so brilliant and worked on hacks. And it's just a wonderful wonderful operator. But it it was kind of just like an interesting twist to that one. Do you ever eat any of the food? Uh, oh my god! Yeah, we are you kidding me? We eat everything. I, I had a feeling that's the best part about like the best part about that show is just that you get to shoot very beautiful things, but the, the food is like that's that's incredible. And you know, we it's also like a very important part of the storytelling. If we're being perfectly honest, like you know, we the, the first thing we do when we arrive in the city is myself, the director, the producer. We go to dinner at, at the restaurant and um, really experience that and. It's it's so important to, to do that, not just for us because like it's delicious, but also like it's you know, that's the um, <laughs> it's it's that's the chef's uh, art, and like for chefs on on that level, like the meal that they that they serve you there, that's their that's their story, and you need to really understand that I think to capture it. Uh, we've been talking for quite a while here, and I, I really just want to touch upon uh, one more thing, which I think is is probably a, a good place for us to wrap up, and that you just did a feature called Happily. And that that just came out a, a couple of months ago, if I'm not mistaken. So 2021 has been a busy year for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm I'm glad that Happily is like finally out in the world. I think we shot that we shot that film in 20, 2018. Oh wow. Um, and then or 2019. I don't know. Everything sort of blends together with the recent events. But it got into uh, the Tribeca Film Festival for 2020, which was unfortunately uh, canceled. And then I believe it's actually going to play at the festival this week, which is really exciting. For, for Ben David. That film was like a true passion project for Ben David. He put his heart heart and soul into it. And I was lucky enough that he sort of brought me along along that journey. He uh, he'd really he'd written the film some time ago and it was it was a challenging, like all independent films that went on its journey to being made that was, you know, very, very challenging for him. But he pushed it, he pushed it over the finish line and he was just like a wonderful director to collaborate with. He was so prepared and had really like truly pre-visualized the whole the whole film in his head before um, I was I was even involved and it was just like 
wonderful, like, and, and, and both challenging and fun to sort of try to get into Ben David's head and, and figure out the images that he had there that were just like so specific. And he really challenged me and, and, and forced me to sort of push my boundaries as a cinematographer. I'd never shot uh, anything like that. It's a very, it's a very ambitious film uh, visually with, you know, a, a very limited indie budget. And I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of, of how it turned out. What's fun about being a cinematographer is you get to you, as, a, as a cinematographer, it's great that you get to collaborate with a lot of different types of people and a lot of different filmmakers. And the best experiences are when you really you really trust a director and you're sort of along for the ride and you get to push yourself and try something new. Adam, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate us uh, doing a little bit of a deep dive here into your work and career. And I hope, uh, yeah, actually, you know what? Before I sign off, where can people find you? If, if people want to follow your work online, do you do social media or anything like that? Is there a place? Do you do, you do the Instagrams? Are you, uh, are you one of those folks? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. It's real Adam Bricker is the handle, and is that I love R- posting. Um, R-E-A-L or R-E-E-L? R-E-A-L. Ooh. <laughs> It should be. It should be the other. Though. No, That's no, it clever. shouldn't. I think R E A L um, is better. But I, I, anytime someone says Adam, real, I, I have to ask. So. Yeah. No. And if the Adam Bricker that has my name as a handle is listening, I'm open to negotiating for that handle. I would really like to have it. Um, but yeah, no. I, I'm on Instagram, and I love. Um, I've been posting stills from from hacks, and um, I love uh, sharing that work and being able to tag the crew that I collaborated with. So there's good stuff on there. Hey, uh, well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for being on the Cinematography Podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It was a blast. All right. That was uh, Adam Bricker. Adam, thanks so much for being on the show. I can't wait to have you back sometime in the near future. And congrats on on that Emmy nomination. You know, that little thing. Yeah. You know, that thing. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) hey, Hey, Ben, I think it's time to pay the bills. I like paying bills. We got to thank Aperture for helping to make this show possible. We have some new sponsors coming on next month, but uh, Aperture has been a stalwart and been with us for a long time. And I want to do a reminder about the LS 600 D pro. It is a really bright light that, um, frankly, you know, I hear people say to me, well, why should I get a 600 versus a 300 versus a a 120 or, or something smaller? Uh, the the bigger, brighter the instrument, the easier it is to fill a space with light, the more intensity you have. You can always go down. Easy to go down. It's hard to get more out of something that, that just doesn't have it. So, of course, you can buy the, the 600D Pro over at Hot Rod Cameras, but it is an incredibly powerful, compact light that is not very expensive. And in the LED realm, there are some units that are brighter and that do have more output, but you pay a lot more money. You get usually a much larger footprint. The 600D is sort of this kind of uh, workhorse light. It's very, very equivalent to like the 1K tungsten of of days of yore, except that it's daylight. And if you did want to make a tungsten, it's really easy to drop a gel in front of that. And voila, you've got a tungsten light. But the whole thing can be battery powered and it's got a cool ballast and it's it comes in a case and it's just a a kick butt little powerful light and if someone was thinking like hmm, maybe i should buy a 1k tungsten no you should buy a 600d pro that's 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 really the reality today it's it's an it's not a fresnel but there's a fresnel attachment and there's other soft box attachments and all kinds of other things you can put on there so in many ways it's super flexible and it's absolutely worth taking a look at if you are looking for a light right now that is uh, can do a lot of different things, because that you know lights are kind of specialty items. They they do one thing. They they can do two things. Some of them can do three things. But uh, a light like the 600D Pro can be used in many different ways, and it's just super practical. And and it's wor- absolutely worth the money. It's worth uh, it's worth investing. So if you have other questions or you want to check one out, definitely uh, hit us up at Hot Rod Cameras, and we will give you the full lowdown on the 600D Pro. They're kind of hard to come by, but I do know that we have a quite a few do in stock, I think probably by the time that this episode goes live or maybe within a, a couple of days after. So if it's interesting to you, uh, yeah, give us a call. We'll help you out. Definitely check that out. That that sounds awesome. I mean, are, are a lot of people still using like tungsten lights? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I talk to rental houses all the time and they tell me that still airy like soft bank kits with uh, tungsten lights inside of it is a standard rental item. They get thrown on a truck. People have uh, plenty of tungsten kits. So uh, and and granted, they're, they're relatively inexpensive, um, but they do take up quite a bit of juice. They, they take a lot more power. And if you break a bulb, uh, that's kind of a hassle and you don't usually have to worry about 
breaking uh, an LED light, especially these sort of like COBs, like the well, the Aperture 600D. And moreover, like, I mean, to me, as we've shifted away from tungsten lights, and I own a fair number of tungsten lights, you know, that I've purchased over the years. Uh, as we've moved away, to me, the biggest thing, you know, yeah, it, the power thing, like, you know, ne- you're never going to have to worry about tripping a breaker if you're working in like somebody's house or you're you're filming on a location where you're using house power but moreover no one's gonna boil alive man like tungsten lights are so hot and if you're in a tight room you're gonna be playing that game where you're constantly turning off the air conditioner and turning it back on and tungsten lights are are great lights i'm not down on tungsten lights inherently but man leds are just they save you so much in terms of heat and power and they're lighter to carry you know like if you're able to work with them to me i I, it would just be i would be hard pressed to uh to start using tungsten lights again unless there was a a really good reason for it and now short ends hey uh ben i think it's time for short ends uh what is your obsession this week what 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 do you got going on matt i know i've talked about masterclass i swear i'm not on the payroll of masterclass what Uh, masterclass again it's a really good service so James Cameron did a master class. Holy crap. And I watched it and it, fe- it, I mean, like he's dispensing a lot of very useful information in my opinion, but even if you just take it as like an interview with James Cameron, like a, it's a, you know, it's a few hours uh, interview with James Cameron kind of going through his creative process. He shows storyboards that he did for the Terminator for the first Terminator that are some of the most gorgeous storyboards I have ever seen in my life. He drew them and he shows a lot of his boards throughout the whole thing. And it it kind of reaffirms something that I know when, when we had Russell Carpenter on the show, uh, I asked Russell, the most burning question I had about James Cameron is, which was, is it true that he could literally just fire anyone on the crew and do their job better than him? And I, I believe Russell said more or less. Yeah. And when you watch this, you're like, yeah, he understands everything about the process top to bottom and uh, and kind of seeing his creative process but also understanding his artistic process and his artistic impulses and i'm the first to admit like i don't love every james cameron movie ever made i, I don't think avatar is uh is, uh, avatar was amazing spectacle for its time but as like a piece of writing and a piece of drama not my favorite thing of all time but it's interesting to hear him go through that but he spends a lot of time talking about the first Terminator movie and how to make a movie that had a very low budget, how to make it all work. And he talks about doing things that, uh, that we've all done, but maybe I didn't, I certainly didn't know about it when I was, you know, in in film school or early on in my career, like, you know, how he could basically say like, okay, I'm just going to pick this shot up later. And he would do a lot of basically would direct it, but he would do a lot of second unit stuff later inserts and stuff like that. He would just know he wanted them and he would board them. And, uh, it, it, he, he's a very thorough filmmaker and, uh, very thoughtful about his process. And, uh, so I know that I've, I've already talked about a bunch of master classes, especially Ron Howard's, which I still think is probably one of the best instructions in film directing I've ever seen Ron Howard's masterclass. But I, I think this was actually, uh, this is a close second. Like I think he's got just some phenomenal information in there. And if you are, uh, so, so inclined as to check out masterclass, uh, I, I'd, I'd give the James Cameron one a, a shot. That's uh that's high praise. Yeah. It's, it sounds really, uh, very fascinating. Maybe I'll take a look. So Ben, I don't know if you know this about me, but uh, I spend a lot of time working even when I'm not working. And one of the things that uh, I have a tendency to harp on uh, some people is is shopping as a consumer versus shopping as a professional or shopping as a, a consumer versus shopping as, as a business. And uh, one of the things that makes a huge difference for um, people who are professionals in this industry is free money. I mean, by free money, I mean like financing. And, and, you know, I did not understand financing at all when I got into this industry, you know, 20 something years ago. And, and if I had, I absolutely would not have sat on the sidelines. I would have invested in some equipment, which probably would have, uh, you know, elevated my career in a, in a much different way than, than, than the way it went when I was constantly getting calls from people saying like, Hey, do you have a camera? Do you have lenses? Do you have this, that? And I had to answer no. The financing that is going on right now from Canon is basically some of the best they have ever done and their products are insanely good right now the best cameras they've ever made certainly uh first for cinema and 
they've decided to run these promotions here during this pandemic uh, that I think is to encourage people to uh, to really take a look at them. And I think it's it's very much worth it. They're doing four years of zero percent financing, which basically means they're paying all of Whoa. the interest that you would be paying, like if you put it on a credit card or if you got a, a, a lease from a third party. But yes, what they're financial services for four years they'll pay all the interest so that means uh, it doesn't cost you a penny extra to use their services their their financial services and if you work with a dealer like hot ride cameras you're you're going to get a great deal just to, to start with but now you're also not paying anything extra for breaking up those payments and so the way that you figure out how much something costs you is you literally just divide the total price by 48 and voila that's how much it's going to cost you every month and for some of these items uh you it, depending on who you are and what you're you're doing, you might be able to rent out that number of times per month to cover your payment. So if you are able to hmm. actually rent something and do that consistently, that means you're basically paying zero dollars to own an expensive piece of gear. Like so, for example, the C500 Mark II, they're sort of like flagship, you know, small footprint, full frame camcorder, which is brilliant. And then. Their lesser cameras, and I say lesser because lesser in price or maybe lesser in a couple of features, but not necessarily lesser in uh, as, as quality, like a C300 or a C70, these are much less expensive cameras, they're not being left off this promotion. It's not four years, but it's two years. And that's kind of ridiculous, especially since it's like, you know, a $6,000 camera uh, approximately for like a, a C70 you divide that by 24 and figure out how much you would get to rent it and then how much you would how much income you would 48 make. yeah no 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 it's only 24 it's only two years for the c70 so no oh, unlike the, i'm sorry so, my bad yeah so uh so but if you do that with something like that then uh you know if you're renting it out for three or four hundred bucks each time you rent it out you don't have to rent it out very often to actually cover your payment and i know that there are people out there who have uh you know relationships with rental companies either for consignment or they use some of those like uh, services like ShareGrid. i'm not necessarily advocating that for everyone it may not be the right fit for you but uh sometimes people have employers too who are like hey you know uh, i need you to shoot this and i'm willing to pay x amount of dollars on a camera rental and so it makes a lot of sense to own some equipment that essentially becomes free or costing you very, very little. And look, you know, this is something that I do all the time at Hot Rod Cameras is have this this conversation. And if anyone wants to have this conversation, of course, I'm happy to, to get into it. But it's sort of been an obsession for me lately because I've got a client in Texas. He was just hitting me up. Uh, he wants to buy a C70 or maybe he did buy a C70 right now. Someone else in, in my shop is, is working with him. But it's like it makes so much sense to not have to plug plunk down all that cash deplete your bank account to to buy something outright when the manufacturer does this free money financing where it doesn't cost you any interest it doesn't cost you anything extra i mean why not divide it up it it just it's such a uh, it's, it's such a more professional way to work unless you just are mr money bags and have, have cash flowing everywhere and you need, you need like the write-off and the depreciation there is a there is a use there's a case to be made for for paying for something all at once and i suppose there's a case for you know working with credit card companies and stuff too but if someone wants to get into all that or they want to have a discussion or they have to build a studio or whatever, that that is a big part of what I do is I have those sort of you know, pretty high level discussions with companies all the time, trying to figure out the best way for them to get equipment. And when Canon does something like this, they make it really easy for someone to get uh, excellent equipment and not have it be uh, too painful. So so anyway, there, there you go. That's 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 my short end this week. My short end is Canon is doing really brilliant stuff and making it very easy for people to move into their product line. And if you were thinking about going with a camera system like that, uh, this is truly like 2021 is there's never been a better time. This is absolutely the best time to to get into any of this stuff. Well, and uh, is the C500 the one that does 6K? You could round up to 6K. That, that's fine. 5.9K, well, full frame camera body. Yes. I just edited a project for my friend Joe Freya that was shot on that camera. And I have to say the footage looked amazing. Like it, And it was a lot of it was uh, shot uh, with available light in various locations or very moderate adjustments to the lighting because they were running and gunning. My friend uh, Pete Alton was the cinematographer on it. And I mean, Pete's an amazing DP. But the whole thing just really looked looked amazing. I, I was blown away because I, I hadn't I don't think I'd cut anything that was shot on the C500. 
Yeah, it, it has a pretty ridiculous ISO sensitivity and it has an advertised dynamic range that's, that's very high. I, I know it's being used on uh, on big, big shows right now. And um, it does have built-in ND filters. It does have 6K, it has 4K, it has 2K. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very capable camera and absolutely worth consideration if, you've, uh, if, if you're looking at something that's around $16,000. It's, 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 it's really yeah. amazing. And there are other no, less was, expensive very cameras cinematic. that... Yeah, that that are that are a good match for it and uh, and very full featured. So, it's definitely for those on more on a budget. The the C seventy is absolutely worth looking at. It's, it's a you know fifty five hundred dollar camera approximately for the for the body and absolutely uh, a really impressive look. So, so uh, who do we need to thank today? Oh man, let's thank Kay Zalatrachi, who's probably listening to you and I yak right now. Oh my god. <laughs> And he's just been boiling about Canon the whole time because he wants to come in and talk about black magic. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> I, oh, I know, yeah, no, I know, I know he likes cameras. black. I know he likes black magic, but I think he's also really interested in Leica right now, which is which is interesting. I've talked to him about that a couple of times. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's he's mentioned that to me as well. Hi, Kays. Uh, also, we should thank our amazing editor Ben Katz, and hopefully, we didn't make his life too too tough this week. But you know, you never know. Thanks, Ben. Right now, he's going to be cutting us up and putting fart noises in and all that stuff. So it'll be good. As he should. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, we, we definitely need to thank our uh, amazing kick-ass producer, Alana Cody, who uh, still has... We have so many cool interviews coming up, like, immediately. I, I, I don't, I don't want to say who they are. I, I want to talk about it, but I'm not going to. But anyway, we have some great interviews coming up, and, uh, and it's all her work. All right, Ben, where can people find you if they if they want to connect with you outside of the show? Please go to benrockonline.com. Uh, you can find uh, you can see a bunch of my work on there. You can uh, find all my social media links and stuff. Uh, feel free to hit me up on any of those things. Say uh, t- tell me that you're a listener to the show and, uh, you know, and, and bing bong boom. We're friends. Uh, Ilya, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, uh, hotrodcameras.com. That's where I spend much of my time, probably probably too much time. And if you do come in and mention the show, we have a few t-shirts left. Uh, you can still get a t-shirt. It may only be uh, limited sizes, although we seem to still have plenty of women's shirts. So just FYI, the free t-shirt thing may be coming to an end until I can get some more swag going. So hopefully that'll be sooner. We need some, than some later. Cinepod shirts. We need to get some Cinepod shirts going, man. Uh, y- you know what? If someone out there would like to to design a Cinepod shirt, then I, I'd be happy to uh, turn it into reality if, if it meets approval of, of our team. But uh, yes, I've, I, I, I have not actually uh, designed a shirt, but if someone else would like to design a Cinepod shirt, then uh, please hit me up because uh yeah we we could use one for sure well uh that will do it for this week and we will see you next week at the cinematography podcast thanks for listening this has been the cinematography podcast presented by hot rod cameras find your next camera lens or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com don't forget to subscribe to our show on itunes and connect with us on facebook and twitter thanks for listening